Man, you may be seated. This time I ask Matthew Campbell to come forward. Matthew is our newest, our new children's pastor. Would you come stand by me, Matthew? Amen. I'm going to ask our elders and our deacons to come, and let's just stand around our brothers. We committed to this ministry that God's called him to. Literally came on staff a few weeks ago, but then he went off and had surgery and all the other kind of stuff. So. We hadn't had the opportunity to take this, this advantage, presenting him his license to ministry today, as well as just uh, laying our, our hands upon him as our, uh, our symbol of God's presence on his life. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your grace, your blessings. As we lay hands on our brother today, we do so in faith, believing that, Lord, as you lay your hand on our lives to call us for, we stand here as your representatives to just agree with your calling and your anointing on, on Matthew's life. We pray that, God, you would use him for your glory, that you would surround him with your presence, Father, that you'd guide his mind every step of the way this ministry you called him to. Mostly, Father, as I believe it's his prayer is, that you'd be glorified in him and through him. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 God bless you, Matthew. Pray for you, brother. I want to remind you, gentlemen, Friday night is the men's dinner. We're going to be sharing something with you. You're going to blow your mind so you do not want to miss Friday night at the dinner. I mean, it's going to blow your mind. So I'm not going to tell you now. You just have to be there to get, to get the information, get the news. Uh, it's exciting, exciting news. We had a lot of things that we're laying out for our men's ministry for the 2016. Many of you guys, as possible, be there uh, as we talk about these plans and lay out these things before you. I think you're going to be really excited about what the Lord's up to. But so I'm slobbering all over myself. Which proves my point in my message today. God use anybody. <laughs> We're talking today a new series we've entitled Against All Odds, all right? And this series is an important series because we all come to that place in our lives and we, we deal with those issues in our lives. Did I leave my glasses sitting there? Right there beside you? Nope. Well, yeah, oh, there they are. So what's the matter with me? One of those days, folks, just bear with me, all right? We all come to those times in our life when uh, things just appear to be absolutely hopeless. I don't know if you've been there before. If you're not, sooner or later, we all get there. Uh, do not let yourself believe that just because you're a believer that bad things don't happen. Jesus said directly in red letters in the New Testament, in this world, you will have trouble. You're going to have tribulation. He wasn't just talking about the fact that being a Christian presents its own set of troubles that are unique because you're swimming against the current of, every, of, of everything that the world does and stands for. You're going the other direction. But just as a matter of fact, there's going to be difficulties in every person's life. As long as we live in a world that's been tainted with sin and with Satan, then we have to deal with these issues, one and all. I hate to tell you that. But there are those times when it just seems to be insurmountable. You know, it just seems that everything that can not be right, it just ain't right. Everything can be wrong, it's gone wrong. All the odds seem to be stacked against you. Sometimes it's in your job, might be sometimes in your family, sometimes in your personal ministries, you just feel like, Oh, you know, here I am, what's going on? There's just nothing going to go what I believe is the Lord's way here. And you just feel boxed in. How you deal with these kind of situations where you're sensing that against all odds mentality, how you deal with those situations reveals a great deal about your character as well as your personality. But as we look at scripture today, I want to bring out a character. Where if you're not careful, you just read right over him. You may not have even noticed him. You may have read it 10 times and still it is so minuscule in the context of all the other scriptures around it that you just lose this, this particular verse. This guy that we're going to talk about today against all odds is a man by the name of Shamgar. And Shamgar stood out as one of the judges of Israel. But there's only two verses that talk about him, all right? In Judges 3.31, you have this introduction of Shamgar. And it's interesting. It says, after him, talking about Ehud, was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. He's listed as one of the judges of Israel. Remember, there's this time that Israel's come into the promised land. They're without a king. No king has been anointed yet. Uh, Saul, David, none of these things have come to pass yet. And in this intermittent period, with the law and the prophets and the judges, Israel is given guidance. So we're in this period of time that this particular man appears on the scene, Shamgar. He's an unlikely hero. He's not the candidate for most likely to succeed. In fact, just looking at a little bit of this, this, this little incident that it talks about him, 
you don't see a lot. In fact, chapter five, verse six, there's another mention in all it says is in the days of Shamgar. In other words, he did function as one of those judges during Israel's history that God used this particular man to deliver the nation of Israel. It's kind of a, 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 of a known name. I mean, if I, if I said Shamgar before today, you'd say, huh? What are, you, what are you talking about? Is that someone or is it something? What's, what's, a, what's a Shamgar? You, you, you probably have to go Google it, you know, find out what, what, what is Shamgar? Who is Shamgar? He really is a, this humble little character in Israel's history that really didn't have a lot of information. There's not a lot to identify this man or even his weapon when it says that he delivered Israel. He delivered Israel and he, he used this ox goad to kill 600 Philistines, all right? But God uses him to rescue the nation at a time when things were extremely and incredibly difficult. In fact, as the children of Israel looked around at their situation, were just impossible situations. These, these were grim times and these were difficult times. In fact, let me give you a little background of the story here and talk about the times. This is a time when, when Israel uh, has been flirting with other deities, false gods and idols. And a lot of it, you know, came from their... I believe, I'll use this terminology, their over-domestication of God. In other words, they brought God down to their size, their thinking, put him in their little, you know, finite minds and they got it all figured out. Add to that that this God of Israel had made a covenant promise with them and he swore to protect them. He swore to be their God by promises and by oaths and by offerings, all right, and by sacrifices. So they had this promise, this covenant, unbreakable promises of God on their behalf. But all that led them to this presumption. In fact, it was a presumption upon the mercy of God to the point that they were indulging their desires and forgetting God. They were mixing Baal worship, the heathen pagan practices with worship of Jehovah God. Now, because of this, the scripture says that God would let these people suffer difficulty. In fact, he allowed the Philistines to overrule and override them. Remember at this particular time of history, the children of Israel are in the promised land, but they're not experiencing the blessings and they're not experiencing the fullnesses that God had promised them to have. Much of it was due to the fact of their disobedience. And again, I believe their presumption. We would call it abusing the grace of God. Same thing that happens with God's people today, the children of God in the kingdom of God. We get presuming upon God's grace, presuming upon God's faithfulness, presuming upon God's goodness. We stop praying, we stop believing, we stop seeking, we stop reading, we stop pursuing God. And that's when the doors of difficulty seem to be thrown open wide and God has to get us to the same place that he got the children of Israel to in the book of Judges. It's interesting, you know, and, and, and we're living in, in a time when that, that, that's really not that much different from the time that, that the children of Israel were going through. In fact, the Philistines had overrun the land. And as a result of it, they were taking whatever they wanted, stealing whatever they wanted, doing whatever they wanted. And the people of Israel were suffering greatly. I remember seeing a bumper sticker not too long ago. You may have seen this one. It says, uh, you need God and God needs you. You ever seen that one? Well, half of that's true. <laughs> You need God. You need God desperately. But you know as well as I, we don't always realize that, do we? We don't always realize how much we need God. A lot of times do we get in a situation that's kind of that against all odds mindset. And then we start realizing just how much we need you. In fact, we sing songs, I need you more today than yesterday. No, you need God all the time. All right. In reality, that's the simple truth of the land. You know, and, and here the people of Israel were, much like the church is, our flirtation with the world, our flirtation with what the world has had to offer us, the indulgences of the world around us has caused us to forget God. Or even in Psalm 78, when it described this period of Israel's history, it says they limited God. We don't let God exercise his full right and rule of sovereignty over our life. We get involved with ourselves. We get involved with our world. We get involved with what's going on around us. That's the essence pretty much really of what idolatry is. We don't make graven images. I think it was Billy Graham who said, we no longer carve graven images. We just have graven mental images. Things that we exalt that are above God. Ideas that are above God. Our way above God's way. Our will above God's way. 
And in doing all that, we do the same thing as Israel did. We reduce this invisible, infinite, sovereign creator to some kind of man-sized, predictable representation that's formed just the way we want him. It's the God of our own liking. It's the God of our own thinking. That is the curse of this generation, I believe. We want to be people of faith. We want to be Christians, so to say, but we want it to fit our bill of goods. We want it to be how we want it. We want it to fit our definition. It emphasizes us. It, it, it promotes us. It builds us. It's about our prosperity. It's about our well-being. It's about our health. It's about our success. And we want God to kind of fit that mold that promotes all that in us, but we kind of put him off to the side in what his will is. So here the children of Israel now suffer as a result of it. And I believe America suffers as a result of it today because we've been so preoccupied with what we want. Now, we've reduced God to this level, then we have no real hope, do we? We've also, I think, when we do this, we forget God's, let's use this word, inscrutability. We forget the ways of God. We forget how God works. We, get, we forget the means and the methods and the principles and the promises of God's word. And we just walk away and, and live in despair instead of living in victory. Here's this man Shamgar on the other hand. He's a no name. He's a nobody, no pedigree, no background. He uses his stupid weapon, which is really a farm implement, an ox goad. And God uses him to deliver the people of Israel. Uh, you know, I think most of us, when we see God use people and the kind of people that God uses, it usually causes a, a little bit of surprise. But maybe, I want you to capture this today, maybe in some similar situation, you find yourself today and it's a bad deal. It's like the Philistines that have come over Israel. There's no hope. They're being robbed. They're being destroyed. They're being ruined on every hand. But at the same time, here stands God ready to do something in, 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 in glorious way in the people's lives, but they find themselves completely at the nemesis, you know, at the mercy of their nemesis, the Philistines. I'll kind of give you a little bit further story about how, what was going on in the land at this time with the Philistines. There were two things about what was happening. One, it was a time of terror. And two, it was a time of incredible vulnerability. They felt extremely exposed. In fact, in regard to this time of fear, they were afraid of the Philistines. They were afraid of going out in the streets. They wouldn't travel. They were afraid of being robbed. They were afraid of being killed. Many times, as we've seen in certain situations, like as in Gideon's day, they had even abandoned their villages in their homelands and were hiding out in caves because they were afraid. They were afraid of losing something, afraid of missing something, afraid of, uh, uh, of loss. But it's also, as I said, a time where they were extremely vulnerable. And they were vulnerable because they were not able to defend themselves against their enemies. In fact, they had laid down their weapons. They had surrendered their weapons to the Philistines. In fact, on top of that, you want to feel exposed and vulnerable. The Philistines had made it unlawful in their mindset for any Israel, Israeli village to own, to have a blacksmith where weapons could be made. And so not only they had surrendered themselves, still living in fear, thinking that somehow the enemy would change their attitudes towards them if they just gave up their weapons and gave up their blacksmiths, but it, it didn't work. They, they were lied to. This is the caution we should probably be giving America today. What happens when you lay down your defenses? What happens when you give up so easily and yield yourself to, to people who have no history of truth or telling the truth? How easily we're deceived. This is the same with Israel time of stupidity, so to say. They had given up the fighting chance. They had given up the weapons that were available to them. In fact, the, the Philistines had so convinced them of their inferiority that they'd even talked them into giving the weapons that they did have over to them. Things were bad in Israel. People were afraid. The morale was low. They, they were defeated. They felt hopeless. They, there was nobody in Israel looking for a brighter day at this particular point in time. They lost confidence in themselves. They'd lost faith in God. What are we going to do? But in the midst of all that, what's that passage in, in Ephesians where it's talking about all oh, how we were dead in our trespasses and sin, how that we were bound by children of wrath. But then that verse comes up and says in, in Ephesians, but God, nobody was looking for that but God, but Shamgar here. This strange name fellow 
who has no real identity given to him. It doesn't give his pedigree. It doesn't give his background. It doesn't give his lineage. It's just a little simple sentence here of this family. No tribe is mentioned, but here God takes this man, Shamgar, and he becomes the tool which God is going to use to bring deliverance to the people of Israel. Here's Shamgar who killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad. And by the way, if you're wondering what an ox goad is, you'll not find it listed under the list of weapons of mass destruction. And well, it made it on the Philistine list, all right? <laughs> because Shamgar was holding it. Well, what's an, what in the world is an ox goad? An ox goad is, is a, basically a, a pretty big size stick, kind of like a rod for shepherding, but a little different because you dealt with ox. So on one hand, <clears throat> sometimes it's metal covered like with bronze or something was a very sharp point. And guess what that was used for? When you got the ox and you're moving it forward, you give them a little stick with the, with the sharp pointed ox goat, they have a tendency to get moving, all right? On the other end was, a, was, a, was a, like a paddle made out of bronze and it was put on the other end of this big stick. And that paddle, kind of a little shovel into thing, about the size of your hand, was used to clean out the hooves of the ox when they got filled with mud and clay from working hard. The, the farmer would go over, lift up the, the leg and would peel out whatever had gotten into the, to the ox's hoof. That's an ox goat. Now, as I said, not under the weapons of mass destruction, but certainly uh, in the hands of the right man, it's extremely effective. 600, by the way. It doesn't say if it was all at once in a day's time or the week's time or during the time or the period where he delivered the children of Israel. But what's amazing about it this instrument, just a plain old farm implement in the hands of this, probably this plain old farmer. In fact, the kind of the idea is that, that seems to be possessed here is this, this guy's a nobody from nowhere. And it was most likely <coughs> that he took a band of peasants and farmers who went out and defeated the Philistines. Now here, here part of this, this issue here that, that's going on, you know, with the, with, the, with the children of Israel was, here's Shamgar, and here's millions of other Jewish families and men standing by, all seeing the same things happen to them, all filled with despair, all filled with defeat, all experiencing depression in their lives. And watch the use. There's no way. It's just, it, we're, we're sunk. We're doomed now. Except Shamgar. You know what I think the difference with Shamgar is? The difference is most of the people in Israel were in their little houses or caves, hiding out, praying, Lord, bless me. Lord, protect me. Lord, meet my needs. Lord, heal me. Lord, help me. Lord, bless my home. Lord, bless my job. Lord, give me a raise. Lord, I need a bigger car. On and on it would go. Individual people only concerned about their individual needs and individually getting by. For lack of better terminology, I think Shamgar's in his house watching what's going on and he's ticked off. He doesn't see the individual situation he's in. He sees the nation. He sees the people. He sees the Philistines. He's ticked off every time he sees them carry off somebody's barley grain. He's ticked off every time they steal somebody's sheep or rip off somebody's oxen. He's, he's there wheeling around with his, his ox goad, you know, getting a little more mad every time somebody walks by him with something. But he's a man of God who makes himself available to God. And the Bible says that Yahweh God uses him to deliver the people of Israel. What's the difference? It's not about me. It's about others. How much of your life right now even thinks about others? The nation, the church, the world around us. We're, we've got this little God now. We've reduced him to our little boxes and we put him on the shelf. And there it is. And he's there to meet my need and to help me and to bless me. Is it just real quiet in there or is that sound system not working? <laughs> in Shamgar's hand, this ox goad becomes a lethal weapon that God is going to use to throw off the oppression of the Philistines and set the people of God into a place of deliverance. Now, that's the times and that's the tool, a man with an ox goad. But let me give you three elements of truth here. Why did God choose Shamgar? And this is where I think we, 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 why would God choose you or choose me? We have to have the mindset, I don't need something else. I'm going to start right here. 
Most people have it in mind, I will get somewhere before God will use me. I will get something else before God uses me. I will have to have this before God uses me. I need Brother Joe to bless me before God uses me. I need this to happen. No. What you need is just God. That's what it all really boils down to. This guy, he's not looking for his political connection. You know, he's not looking and he's not looking for somebody else. He's not saying, well, you know, uh, 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 Ben Carson or, 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 or Donald Trump might be the man for the job. You know, we need a strong woman. It, it's Hillary or Carly or whoever else. Listen, if you're looking to the Democrats, Republicans or the independents or anybody else to save this nation or to rescue us as a people, we're in trouble. We're in deep trouble. Could be that God wants to do something with you. Could be that God has something for me. But it means I have to realize that I don't need to get somewhere first. I need to start where I am. I, I, it doesn't list him as having any kind of education here. It doesn't, have any, any, doesn't even list any military experience. I mean, we think about it, you know, okay, God's going to deliver Israel. Let's find who's the general. Let's find out who's got the smarts. Let's see who's got the education. Let's see who's the mover, the shaker, the political, you know, the political haymaker. Who, who's that? Who, that's who we need. No, who we need is God's people realizing who they are, where they are, and realizing God has a purpose for our lives. Uh, amen. Moving out of our shell. Getting out of our little, it's all about me mindset. Why don't people witness to other people? Because they don't care about other people. They're too busy caring about themselves. Why don't people give to other people? They're too busy caring about themselves. Now that's as sweet as I can say it. I can smile, maybe that'll help. <laughs> but it still boils down to the same fact. We've got to break that off and realize I don't need to wait for somebody else and I don't need to wait to get to some other place. Well, you know, if, if this happens, then I'll be, a, if I had this kind of money, then I could be effective. Or if I had this kind of, of gift, then I could be more usable. If I, if I had that personality, or if I was in a better station, if I had more of a place of prominence and power, God, you really ought to use so-and-so. Isn't that the, the mind that a lot of people live with? That, that's, that's the generation of the world we're living in today. We're the deserving. Somebody needs to come help us. Somebody needs to save me. Somebody needs to help me. Somebody needs to elevate me. And God's saying, you need to go do something. Well, what do I, just start where you're at, wherever that is, whatever it means. You know, just go from where you are. Well, Brother Joe, I'm weak. We all are weak. Brother Joe, I'm just not capable. We're all not really capable. This is where God comes in. So, if I'm going to be this person who makes the difference in this world, then I can't sit back on my spiritual laurels, act hopeless and helpless. I'm just a, I'm just a victim. I got to shake all that off. I got to shake off the despair. I have to shake off the depression. I have to shake off the hopelessness and realize what's God want. He wants somebody just humble. Here I am, God. Three times in the scriptures it says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Grace is that supernatural power of God on their life. That's what that is in the simplest definition. The power of God to perform. The power of God to complete. The power of God to compete. The power of God to win. That's grace. Where does that come from? It comes from God, but he gives it freely to who? The humble. God gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to the humble. God gives grace. Three times it says it and alludes to it on more places than just three. Shamgar just grabs up what he's got and he goes out from where he's at. He doesn't wait for an army. He doesn't look for the group of a thousand who are going to kind of chant his name. He's just not satisfied with status quo and says, you know, I, 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 I can't take this anymore. This is enough. Somebody has to do something. What happens if we do nothing? You know what happens? That's why we live with fears and that's why most people live under stress and de despair. All right. Uh, there's a great article I read not too long ago. It's written by a guy, and it's not a spiritual article. It's just a, this, this principles are, are biblical. It's written by a, name, a guy named Salvatore uh, Maddy of the University of California. And he says, you know, there's three C's that people need to learn in dealing with stress. Anybody here deal with stress? Anybody deal with stress? Is there a stressful situation in your life right now? Let me give you three C's on how to deal with stress. Number one is commitment. And this is for believers. Commitment. Say, so what do you mean? When stress hits you, don't stop. When stress hits you, 
Don't give up. When stress hits you, don't bail out. Don't surrender. Don't surrender. Bill, I think we need you in the lobby back there if you can go for me. Don't, don't surrender to stress. Don't surrender to pain. Don't surrender to difficulties. You stay in the mix. Stress is going to come. Stress, stress is part of life. But what most people do when they begin to experience, they kind of fold in their tents or they pull out or they give up. The second thing, the second C is control. You say, what do you mean? I, I can't control stress. Don't try. But you can control your situation. God has put us as, as, as people with authority. God has given us this position uh, 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 and this privilege of being people who make a difference in life. God has called us to a unique station as Christians. In other words, that Satan can't control our lives anymore. He may try to pressure us. He may try to, 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 to lay all the kinds of stress on us that he can. But listen, I can control situations. I can't control stress, but I can get in the situation and say, hey, this is not going to run my life. I'm going to seek God's face. I'm going to be strong in the grace of God. I'm going to trust the Lord God. I'm going to be what God wants me to be. That's where you are. You start where you are. You realize, one, that you, hey, you, have to, you can't run. Commitment. Two, I can take charge of the situation. And three, is the, is the C for challenge. What do you mean? Listen, stress is normal. It's going to happen in this world. It's the ultimate pressures of life that happen. Stress is normal. But listen to me. It's also an opportunity to learn about the grace of God. It's an opportunity to learn what God's up to. The tragedy is most people, when stress comes, fall into a place of self-pity. Oh, I'm so stressed. It's so hard, Joe. It's so difficult. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to quit. It's not going my way. It didn't work out the way I thought it would work out. I think I bail out. You know, that's probably why the hundreds of people leave the ministry every day in America that leave the ministry. It'd work out. I thought something else would be. And you, you fold up your tent. I mean, it's one thing when Satan beats us up, and that happens at times. But it's another thing to remain beat up. <laughs> that's even worse, just to stay there. Or to sit back and whine. Oh, it's not working now. You. Shamgar said, I'm not going to sit and whine. I'm going to go to war. There was something better in mind. Let's see what God's up to. In his situation, he sees more than just the difficulties. One is start where you are. Two is this. Use what you got. Use what you have. He had an ox goat. So, is that enough? Yeah, that's enough. Whatever it is in your hand, that's enough. You say, but you know, wouldn't it be better if God chose somebody? No, God chose you. What's he need? He needs you and whatever you got. Just surrender it. It reminds me of the story of Moses. Remember, he comes out, Moses came out of the wilderness. I mean, he'd been on the backside of the desert for 40 years and he meets God at the, at the burning bush. And there at the burning bush, God begins to speak to him. and says, I'm going to use you to deliver Israel. You remember that story? And then he said, well, I, you know, I, I can't, you know, you need maybe somebody else or I'm not really good at this or I, 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 I need, no. Moses, God just said, what's in your hand? And what was in his hand? It was a shepherd's staff, right? Well, that's, that was... That, that identified who he was. He was a shepherd. That's what he did. All right. And God says, throw that down. And he throws it down. And remember, it became something. What did it become? A snake. All right. I think the message is pretty simple. Whatever you are, whoever you are, whatever you think you are, whatever you got, throw it down. Amen. You throw it down before the Lord. He'll take the snake out of it. All right. He'll take that which will be destructive of you out of it. And then he tells him, pick it up again. And he tells him, pick it up by the tail, which is usually a strange request when you think about picking up snakes. Amen. I'd rather pick it up by the head. That's where all the business takes place. But the head, that's God's business. You leave him in charge is the mindset here. You're still holding it, but now you become his minister. Now you become his representative. Now you become his shepherd. Now you become his ambassador. Now you become the one who's there to represent all that he is. But it starts with where you are and what you got. Throw it down. I mean, it's the same with David. I'm going to fight Goliath. Well, you need this weapon. No, that, that doesn't work for me. Well, what are you going to go with? Well, what I've got. What do you got? A sling. <laughs> Over, it's, it's a little boy who comes to hear Jesus. He's got, he's got five loaves and fish, right? You want to feed the thousands. That's not enough. It's what I got. 
In other words, God takes who you are and God takes what you got and God does something supernatural with it. God makes something different with it. God takes, God takes you and puts his hand on you and does something with you that cannot be explained any more than can be explained about Sham, Shamgar and his ox goat. God will take you and what you are. I mean, he could have made excuses. Lord, last time I checked, ox goats weren't on the list of weapons. It's just, it's just, just a farmer. I'm not qualified. I'm not equipped. You know, and uh, Lord, people don't fight wars with ox goads. That's not your business. What, what's, what are you trying to say? I'll tell you what you're saying. You're saying God's in this box that you can understand. You got God all boxed up where you can figure him out. And I'm sorry, that's not the way it works. God will bust out your box every time. He'll do that which you didn't think could be done. He'll do that which probably for you might have seemed at one point in time to be the impossible, but then he moves over the impossible. Whatever you are, whatever you got, whatever your gifts are, lay them down before the Lord. The third point of this is, in the context of the truths here, the third point is this. Trust God with whatever the results are. I mean, defeating 600 Philistines was a mammoth accomplishment. But it wasn't for God. That was nothing. That's little stuff. That's little things. And what you're looking at today, I mean, from your perspective, what you may be thinking, it's big, but let's bring God into the equation. Do you think it's big in his eyes? Well, man, if I don't make the payment this month, do you think that's big in God's eyes? You don't think God can do that? Man, if he can't do that, how could he even save you and keep you out of hell and give you eternal life? If he can do those things, he can do anything. He is omnipotent, remember. All authority, all power belongs to him. He's still God. He's still sovereign. He still rules over all things. He's the one who turns water into wine. He, he's the one who parts the sea. He's the one who makes the high places, the low places, who makes highways to the byways. It's the, the glory and the grace and the power of God who's able to do abundantly above all you think or ask. Problem is, we don't think or ask. Leave the results with God. You know, we've said it before, God is not looking for people with ability, but he's looking for people with availability. But it's not just that, it's abandoned availability. It's yielded availability. I may not have much, I may not be much. Hey, but you've heard the old saying, little is much if God is in it. And that's the same thing for your life. It's not just for them or for them or for them. Please remember, the Bible makes it clear, God is no respecter of persons. What he did for someone, he'll do for you. But you have to decide and make a hardcore decision of yielding your life. It may well be you've never done that to start with. You may have never have come to that, 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 that climactic moment in your life of decision where you realize that that there's really no hope without Jesus in your life. You may not have come to that place of despair, realize I'm lost, I'm a sinner, I'm without hope, I'm, I'm bound for hell. And with that, that, that understanding that Jesus Christ came and died to save sinners and that he died for you. If you've not come to that place and today you need to open your eyes and say, listen, Jesus, I need you to save me. You know, Jesus put a very strong red letter imperative in the gospel of John when he said, you must be born again. I mean, there's no options there. It's just you must be. You say, well, I, I must be Baptist. I must be Catholic. I must be, no, you must be born again. And the first thing that has to happen in any of our lives is that moment where we come to the place to lay down our hearts and lay down our lives and give ourselves to Jesus. If that hasn't happened, if all you've done is play at religion, all you've done is try to have a God that fits your box, if all you've done is try to go through a baptismal process or get sprinkled or confirmed or go through some catechism at the church, you've missed the mark. You have to have Jesus. Amen. He has to be in your life. And I would say today, I wouldn't walk out these doors knowing the days and the desperation of the times that we live without Jesus Christ in my heart and life. Give your life to Christ today. Give your heart to him. If you do know him and you find yourself like one of the Israelis hiding out in your little tent or your little cabana or your little cavern somewhere and your Christianity is just about you and your life and your needs and you're this and you're that, you're missing the mark. It needs to be all about Jesus. 
in his will. And guess what? When my focus becomes him, you know what he takes care of? Well, he said it, Matthew. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All this other stuff, you take care of. Get the bigger picture. If you're facing that situation in your life today against all odds, I hope, pray you'll get a clear message from God that it's not just about you. It's about him and his purposes, his kingdom and his will being accomplished in you and through you. And your life, when it's thrown down before the king, will be more than just you having your need met. You will be met. But about you seeing other people's lives changed. Other lives' needs met. Other hearts transformed. Let's stand with our heads bowed.